Cool, how about that wind? Uh, this morning in the outdoor showers, the wind would be gusting and the shower would move and it would be like, oh, it's cold. Oh, and so I was <laughs> dancing with the wind. It was, it was, it was awesome. So I'm um, appreciating the earth. It's, it's very much alive today. And I'd like to take this opportunity to honour the land and the people who've stewarded it in the past and the people who steward it now. And, yeah. I'd also like to take this opportunity to acknowledge our Māori brothers and sisters. The energy you've brought to this event for me and the, the stories and the songs and the sacrifices and work you do to keep those stories alive and to keep the language alive and to growing is precious and admirable. And the work you're doing for your people um, inspires me. And it reminds me that the burden of healing, the scars of colonization, uh, is meant to be carried by all of us. So today I want to talk about weaving a beautiful world. And I'd like to, you to pay attention to that little bird. We'll be coming back to them later. It's called the sociable weaver from Africa. And I, I spend a lot of time studying organizations and collaboration and how we can do things together. And I found few metaphors more apt than improvisation in a jazz band. When musicians show up and they've all got their different instruments and there's no clear leader, but there are people who are who have more experience and people who have less and there's a lot of listening and creating space and filling space and we witnessed some of that around the fire a few nights ago and to me it feels like the way humans should work together and it's premised on the idea of having an instrument and in music you can sort of see what instrument someone's got they've got a guitar or a piano or a saxophone or whatnot and you sort of and intuitively it gives you a, a way to orientate around them and when I think about the work of collaborating and working together, the metaphor of a jazz band feels great, but what are our instruments? It's taken me 15 years to figure out what my instruments are in this work. Because when you're showing up and you're working with people, all we have is titles. We'll have like facilitator or programmer or leader or whatever it is, and they're not very good definitions of our instruments, of our gifts. So I think a lot of learning to collaborate together is about learning how to talk about what are our gifts, what are our things that we bring. And so where I've gotten to in myself after 15 years of collaborating is that the instrument that I'm most passionate about, that I'm most excited by, that I can't help but bring to every single thing I do is dreaming and chasing dreams and thinking about futures that aren't and trying to make them real and doing little experiments just out of curiosity. What happens if? What knowledge is there to discover here? And this dreaming and experimenting, I can't help but bring that everywhere I show up. And I'm also reminded by, have you ever heard someone like learn violin or bagpipes or practicing as they go? Well, that's my colleagues over the last seven years as I've been figuring this stuff out. So I'm, I'm very grateful for like tolerating that and supporting that and helping me discover the instruments. And, and I hope you all have um, uh, compassion when the bum notes come out and whatnot in the future. But, it's, uh, but that, that's sort of that what lights, that's what lights me up. So what I'd like to do is share some of the experiments I've been running and things I've been learning over the last little while. So six months ago, we started a process of forming a new team at Inspiral, and it's called the Golden Pandas. There are four of us. It's a cooperative. We each own one share in the company. And the purpose of the company is to develop products for the commons. We create new products that are aimed towards a generative commons-based economy. And we want lots of people to have access to those products and sell them and make livelihoods from them. That's sort of the purpose of the team. And we're calling it a livelihood pod because when you give something a new name, it creates a new ambiguous space and you bring less baggage along for the ride. So this is an experiment I've been running and well, we, we've been running together. And one of the things with this is that we're, going th we're, we're practicing income pooling. So all of us have got day jobs and we do different contracts or businesses where we earn livelihoods through, as well as doing this work of building up new products, which doesn't pay much at the beginning. And we're pooling all of our money in the middle. And we're having conversations with each other about how much should we get paid. And right now we've decided let's pay out everyone equally. Let's just get a baseline paid to each other, each other, and then let's build up a cash buffer and let's have a conversation in the future. So it's a very different way of running money through a small company. And instead of figuring out who's going to add the most value in the future, we're going to trust our ability to have a conversation that, at that time if we need to start differentiating how much people get paid. The other part of it is that our energy, our time, becomes a collective resource. So instead of me just going, oh, I've got an idea, I'm going to run off and try that, I've committed to a process of I'm going to talk with the rest of the team about it. And we're going to give each other advice and we're going to collaborate on what should we be working on. 
And that process, that has been so liberating for me. I've spent most of my life scheming and stressed and worrying. And I, I had a job once in like 2002. And ever since then, it's been the life of a bootstrapping entrepreneur. And there's always like something going on. So over Christmas, I had a holiday. But because the, with the pandas, we were committed to a process in late January on what are we going to work on, I didn't know what I was going to be working on in February. That was so relieving and relaxing. And there's something here where we're not committing to a particular business, a particular industry, a particular hypothesis on how we can make money in the future. What we're committing to is each other. So no matter what businesses we go in or what work we do, we're there to support each other as a team. So it's subtly different from other teams I've been involved in, and it's a really rich experiment for me. A lot of my work, this, this was inspired by a meme around, happy birthday, Ikea, we baked you a cake. And, <laughs> And it's essentially along the lines of decomposing organizations. When you look at organizing systems, that there's typically a brand, there's a legal structure, there's a social structure, there's money flows, there's information flows, and typically you're in all of the systems or you're out of all of the systems. And I'm very interested in, in dynamics where you're in some of them and not in others. How can we have blurry layers around our organizations? So when I start thinking about the word in terms, world in terms of these livelihood pods, then I also start thinking about the world in terms of products. And instead of a product being owned by a company, owned by a single team, it can start to become a nexus of contracts between teams. It's like a web of relationships and agreements about how money will flow, how governance will happen, how work will get done, is a future of a product that I can imagine. And then you can start to imagine how products meet customers through marketing channels and so on, and who controls them and who has livelihoods in them. So this world of a blurry web of people and different language and different ideas, to me, is the, is the organizational form which is really drawing me a lot at the moment. At Inspiral, we're going through a really interesting process right now. We're essentially a cooperative of people. And what you call those people is kind of up for grabs. Some people like entrepreneur or change maker or activist or entrepreneur. No, no, not, you can never find a word that everyone agrees is the right label. But we're a group of people who are fundamentally aligned about trying to make the world a better place. And to me, it really speaks to some threads I've heard here around what, what is it that binds us together? How is it when you meet someone here or in the world where you just go, yes, that's my person, that's someone I want to collaborate with? And the idea that there is a bunch of people who are working to weave a brighter future. They're working to weave a better world. They're committing their whole lives to it. And I think that's the unifying principle. So right now, I'll just call them weavers after that little bird. But Inspiral's a cooperative of them. The key structure we've had since the beginning is we have members, and a member has a share in the cooperative. And the members, the dynamic is, a member is someone that most members trust a whole lot. So you have a group of people where as the group grows in size, it becomes more expensive to join that group because you've got more people to build trust with. It has a natural bound in size. A contributor is someone that one member trusts a little bit and supports a little bit. So this is someone where that size of that group is naturally bounded by the number of members in the group as well. So you have a natural size there. We've hit that size. And we're having conversations about how do we essentially go through constitutional reform? How can we rewrite the fundamental roles, the identities, the language we use in the group to go from one circle to multiple circles. And we're in the thick of it right now. And we're having conversations about, do we want to do this? If we do want to do this, how do we want to do this? And that process of going for a group who's been together for five years, six years, seven years for some of us, to go through a fundamental rewriting of how we work together is really informative. So platform co-ops, this is what Joseph asked me to talk about. And this is a diving platform. Who's heard of platform co-ops? So, uh, if you think about a software platform like Uber or Airbnb, then a platform co-op is a simple idea that that software platform is owned by the people who benefit from it and depend on it. So it's an Uber owned by all the Uber drivers, or Airbnb owned by all the Airbnb hosts. The reason it's so important is that platforms tend towards monopolies. So if you build a Facebook and you're successful, you will eventually be the only social network in town. Same for Airbnb, same for Uber. And if you think about the situation that someone who depends on Uber for their livelihood or Airbnb for their livelihood is in, then they're essentially in the position of a medieval peasant. If you're a peasant and your king sucks, you don't really have much of an option. All you can really do is risk your life and liberty in a rebellion, maybe change power. The innovation of democracy was that you can have peaceful transitions of power. 
if you get a lot of people together agreeing with you, you can have a transition to a new, new way of being. And that's, the, that's why I think platform co-ops are so critical. Because platforms tend towards monopolies and because the power differential between the constituents of the platform and the monopoly is unfair, unless we're going to see government regulation which is very unlikely to break up monopolistic platforms, then I think platform co-ops are essential to an equitable way of doing business in the world of online systems. <clears throat> and I think there's another opportunity here. And this is the opportunity of, if, you have a, if you've got a million people on your platform and you're trying to figure out a way for them to govern it and to exercise power and agree and whatnot, that's a really interesting experiment. If you figure out something interesting, that, ha that might have direct application to how our cities and countries work. So if you have hundreds of platform co-ops around the world, you have hundreds of experiments in governance and the future of our countries. So that's another reason why I think they're really worth in, uh, diving into. Uh, so some other things we're doing is around workshop tours and world, uh, building international networks and running an online learning community and whatnot. Um, but I think the, the vision which is pulling me in lots of these experiments is imagine a world where there are hundreds or thousands of these tight-knit cooperatives of people weaving better futures committed to supporting each other, all under their own brands and auspices and sovereign under their own right. But imagine them linked up, imagine them aware of each other, and each of them, I guess, building their own businesses and experiments. What if one of those discovers the next Uber, the next Airbnb, whatever it looks like, and instead of going towards Silicon Valley and VCs and a command and control coercive extractive financial model, what if they scaled it by asking all their other co-op friends to scale it out with local money and local talent? Would it be possible to start building some quite large entities, quite powerful entities, helping lots of people, democratically controlled, capped returns for investors, social mission intact, part of the generative economy? I don't think we need to do that too many times for the world to take notice. Because one thing about the economy is if you start to make lots of money, everyone pays attention to you and everyone tries to copy you. And if the competitive advantage of a platform co-op is you give power to everyone who is benefited by you, who everyone you depend on, then if everyone just copies you doing that, you've inevitably made the world better. So this idea of swarming networks is something which is fundamentally interesting and, and lots of the experiments are pointing in that direction. So this is a nest that that bird at the beginning weaves. This is the biggest nest in the bird kingdom. So they, they essentially collaborate. They can build nests, that, but sort of uh, South Africa and East Coast of Africa, and they can build nests with like 400, 500 individuals share. They get massive benefits from this. It starts to act like a thermoregulator so that in like the desert with huge temperature fluctuations, this smooths it out. It means the birds need much less energy and they're very competitive. It's quite a successful species. The, the nests are actually so heavy that the telephone companies, because they really like straight poles for building on them, the, the power companies have to build stronger poles because they fall down with heavy nests otherwise. Because <laughs> the water gets on them and they just knock them down. So it's so a great thing. But to me, it really articulates one of the biggest opportunities of our times. If you look at the dominant narrative in many of our institutions, it's that of competition. It's that survival of the fittest, compete with each other, kill or be killed. And it's in our economy. It's in our politics. It's in so many of our institutional systems. And the opportunity is that that's only half the story. The other part of it around cooperation, like yes, we have competitive nature in us, but we have a deeply cooperative nature as well. And that story has been missed by so many of our systems. So if we're looking at building a better world, I think we can essentially out-cooperate the status quo. By getting better at cooperating, by leaning into those muscles, learning those instruments, I think we can start to basically build stuff much faster and bigger and better than anyone expects. <clears throat> so, I'd like to finish with uh, an idea. This is an idea I've been bumping into for a few years, and it's also an idea that I've been bumping into a lot at this event. And it's, uh, this isn't my idea by any means, um, but I'd like to give it voice today to you. So, in 2040, it will be 200 years since the signing of the Treaty of Waitangi. <clears throat> and what would it be like if on that day, about 23 years from now, the people of Aotearoa signed a new document? 
What would need to be in that document? What, what conversations would need to happen to get everyone in the country agreeing on something? What conversations would the, 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 the Pākehā weighed down with unconscious guilt for the crimes of colonisation they're barely aware of? What would they need to see and hear and be part of to fully participate in this document? What conversations would Māori need to be part of to, to put their faith in a new agreement 200 years after the old one and everything that happened since then? What healing would need to take place? What facilitation? What would actually be in such a document? What could we imagine if we dream into the best world we can think of? What would it be like if 23 years from now, Aotearoa, New Zealand, had legal rights of nature, unassailable legal rights, every mountain, every river, every forest, equal alongside human rights? Would that be possible? Do you think we could get that done in 23 years? What would it be like if in that document there was a resource-based currency like the world's never seen before? What would, what would that tell? What would we need to figure out? What experiments? What, who would need to collaborate? What if there was a fundamental rewriting of the relationship with the land? What if the concept of owning land was replaced with stewarding land? Do you think you could get that done in 23 years? That level of agreement? What instruments? Who would need to collaborate? What instruments would they need to bring? What instrument would you want to bring if you were collaborating on that? Like, everyone's busy. We've got lots of nests we're building everywhere. <laughs> but what if this was one nest many of us could collaborate, collaborate on? What would that take? So that's just an idea which has been, I've heard in this group and I'd like to give voice to, and I'd like to leave one part of it, is that I've had a few friends over the last year, few years change their names. John became Mix. Uh, Ruth became a Charlie. And it was such a, it took a while to get used to. Like, we'd known them for a while, you had to practice the new name and whatnot. But it was a fundamental and, uh, announcement of their identity, their intention, who they wanted to be and who they were right now. So what if 2040... Thank you.